News of the Times Murderous Mondays Marguerite Alibert The Courtesan Who Got Away With Murder Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at the scandalous story of a socialite on the move who ends up murdering her husband and getting away with it. Salacious letters written to her from a member of the royal family supposedly help to grease the legal wheels. Marguerite was beautiful, promiscuous, and always looking at a way to move forward. She has much going for her until a bad marriage becomes intolerable to her. In today's episode of Murderous Mondays, we look at the courtesan Marguerite Alibert, her life, her affairs, her relationships, and the murder. We hope you enjoy the show. Marguerite Alibert, a dramatic story of poverty to riches, scandal, blackmail of the royal family, and murder. Marguerite's story began in 1890, born to a modest family her father, a cab driver, navigated the bustling streets of the city while her mother diligently served as a maid in grand houses. Tragedy struck the family when Marguerite's younger brother at the tender age of four met a devastating fate on the unforgiving streets. Struck down by a lorry's wheels, his young life was tragically cut short. Amid the heartache, Marguerite's parents sought solace, but their pain turned to blame, casting a shadow on their oldest daughter. They held Marguerite accountable for the accident, as she was entrusted with watching over her brother that fateful day. In an effort to escape the burden of their grief, and perhaps as a misguided attempt to find a solution. Her parents made a heart-wrenching decision. Marguerite was sent away, uprooted from her familiar surroundings, and cast into the care of the Sisters of Mary boarding school. Within the confines of the boarding school, Marguerite's journey continued, shaped by the austere routines and religious teachings of the nuns. At the tender age of fifteen, she was placed in a home as a domestic servant, embarking on a new chapter. In her new role, Marguerite's hands became accustomed to toil and labour. A domestic servant, she navigated the intricacies of household duties, her life becoming interwoven with those she served. At the age of sixteen, the threads of her life unravelled further. A clandestine affair with an unknown man led to a consequence that couldn't be hidden or ignored. Pregnancy, a life burgeoning within her, became the harbinger of change, but the path forward was far from easy. Cast out of her home once again, Marguerite faced the harsh reality of societal norms and judgments. Replicating her own history, her daughter was sent away from her to live with another family in central France. Amid the turbulent streets of her world, Marguerite faced an uncertain future. As her world darkened, Marguerite's gaze turned to a path less travelled, a path that held both allure and danger, the world of sex work. She had observed that within the shadows of society, a certain stratum of women commanded both power and wealth through their profession, earning the title of courtesan. Intrigued by the possibility of a better life once where she could gain control, Marguerite delved into the world of the sex trade. It wasn't a decision born out of whimsy, but rather a calculated choice to seize an opportunity that she felt held promise. The world of the courtesans beckoned with the promise of financial independence and a newfound stature. Madame Denart, 
a name that resonated with authority within the realms of pleasure, saw something in Marguerite. She recognized the potential beneath the surface, an untapped allure that could elevate her beyond the confines of her past. Denart, a keeper of secrets and a wielder of influence, extended her hand to Marguerite. Under Denart's guidance, Marguerite's transformation began. She evolved from a newcomer to a sought-after presence, captivating the attention of esteemed gentlemen from far-reaching corners of the globe. Marguerite became a mistress to the elite, a figure of fascination to gentlemen of wealth and distinction hailing from lands as diverse as France, England and America. Life as a courtesan. At the age of 17, in 1907, Marguerite met and married 40-year-old André Meller. Meller was rich with a large stable of horses. Meller supplied Marguerite with her own apartments and supported her until the affair ended two years later. However, Marguerite would sometimes call herself Marguerite Meller, although the two were never married. Edward VIII. Between 1912 to 1917, Marguerite continued in her role as high-class mistress to wealthy men. In 1917, Marguerite was introduced to the young Edward VIII of later abdication fame as a means to further the young prince's private sex education. It had been decided that Edward required a full education from an experienced woman and was introduced to Marguerite as the remedy. Youthful letters were written by the enthusiastic 23-year-old prince, letters that would come in useful in years to come. One year later, the prince's interest diverted to another, but Marguerite continued on in her role as wealthy courtesan. In 1919, Marguerite married Charles Laurent, but the marriage was short-lived and dissolved after six months. Marguerite was free once more. The Egyptian Prince In 1921, Marguerite met the man who would change her world. Ali Carmel Fahmi Bey met and fell for Marguerite almost immediately. Ali Bey, known by all as Bey, was very rich. Entranced by Marguerite's vivaciousness and extensive charms, Fami proposed marriage to Marguerite. The marriage would mean living a life in Cairo. Marguerite hesitated, but was eventually persuaded. As part of her agreement to the marriage, the wedding contract itself was supposed to be changed in that she would be allowed to wear Western clothing and, most importantly, that she would be allowed to divorce him. In turn, she would convert to Islam. Unbeknownst to Marguerite at the time, Fahami changed the agreed wedding contract to allow him to take on extra wives. The clause regarding Marguerite's ability to ask for a divorce was thrown out. The marriage was unhappy and destructive. Marguerite did not conform to the social norms of the country she was now living in and was punished appropriately. Stories told of Marguerite humiliating her husband publicly with her dress and behaviour. Still, within Egypt, the marriage continued to sour and spill over into the public attention with Fahami's wealth and social status. Tales were told of Fahami being involved in homosexual relationships. Marguerite publicly spoke of him being torn through unnatural sexual intercourse. The intensity of the war between them grew. 
In 1923, Fahami and Marguerite were in London, having attended the Merry Widow operetta at the theatre. In their hotel room, another violent fight ensued. Around 2 a.m., three shots were heard. Marguerite had shot Fahami three times with a pistol she had hidden under her pillow. From the Hartlepool Northern Daily Mail, the 10th of July, 1923, Egyptian prince found shot, woman detained. A mysterious shooting affair took place at the Savoy Hotel in London earlier this morning when Prince Ali Kamel Fahameh Bey was found shot in the corridor of the fourth floor, almost outside the suite of rooms which he occupied there with his French wife, Marie Marguerite Fahame. He was being taken to Charing Cross Hospital, where he died shortly after admission. Inquiries show that the sound of a revolver shot was heard by a night attendant, who discovered the prince lying on the floor of the corridor in his pyjamas. He was bleeding from a wound in the head. Nearby was a revolver. The deceased, who is about 24 and believed to be a big landowner in Egypt, had recently come over from Egypt. The police, it stated, have detained a woman pending the completion of their inquiries. There was no questions as to who had shot Fahmi. Marguerite was arrested. Fahmi died shortly after. From the Coventry Evening Telegraph, the 10th of July, 1923. Wife charged with murder. Marie Marguerite Fahame, 32, a French woman, was charged at Bow Street this morning with the murder of her husband, Ali Carmel Fahame Bey. She will be brought up before the magistrates later in the day. The couple were married in Paris only a few months ago. Prince Fahame Bey is a member of one of the oldest families in Egypt. Whilst waiting for her trial to begin, Marguerite let it be known of the letters she had kept from the then young and ardent Edward VIII. The letters were passionate and contained explicitly sexual content. Comments would be deemed inappropriate were also made regarding the war as well as some ill-chosen comments regarding his father, the king. The letters could not be released to the papers and the public without a tremendous scandal and potential permanent harm to the royal family. The inquest. Given Marguerite's known connection as a high-priced courtesan, having seats at her inquest was considered a true coup. Servants were sent to wait overnight to attempt to save a seat. From the Pal Mal Gazette, 12th of July, 1923. Hotel Dramatic Inquest. Sensational story of couples relations. Impossible life. Quarrels and insults alleged. At Westminster Coroner's Court this afternoon, the inquest was opened on the young Egyptian subject, a rich landowner, who was found shot on Tuesday morning at the Savoy Hotel, where he had a suite of rooms. His wife, Marguerite Fahame, 33, of French nationality, has been remanded at Bow Street Police Court on the charge of willfully murdering her husband by shooting him with a revolver. Although the inquest was not due to start until two, enormous crowds began to collect outside the court as early as half-past twelve. So vast did the block become that at the quarter to one the nearest Metropolitan Police Station was rung up to disperse the crowd. A large number of Egyptians were among those waiting. The house windows looking onto the police court and mortuary were filled with eager spectators. Wife not present. The wife was represented by Mr. Frick Palmer. 
she did not appear personally, Mr. Frick Palmer told the coroner there was no necessity for her to attend. The first witness, Saeed Enami, an Egyptian subject, said he was secretary to the dead man, whose full name was Ali Carmel Fahame Bey, and his age was 22. His address was Zalamek, near Cairo. Asked if he had any occupation, the witness said he was a landowner and property agent. The coroner said, was he rich? Well, yes, he had 40,000 this year and last year, worth approximately 3 million in 2023, and 120,000 three or four years ago. His income was dependent on the rise and fall of cotton. Witness said, Ali Fahami married in December last year, 1922, to Marie Margaret Laurent who was 32 years of age. He married her in Cairo and had lived with her before he married her. She was a French widow. Since the marriage, they had been living at his house in Egypt. They left Egypt on May the 18th and went into the Majestic Hotel in Paris until June the 30th. On July the 1st, they came over to London. Witness was with them all the time. Deceased and his wife occupied suite 41 on the fourth floor of the Savoy. They had lived on very bad terms. They disputed because of jealousy and other reasons. They used to insult and smack each other openly. It was as an impossible life. Jealousy was the principal cause. I remember once in Cairo, there was a great dispute between them in the hall of the Majestic Hotel. He was with his two sisters and his brother-in-law, and they were insulting each other in front of them, and she insulted them as well. Story of Distressing Scenes His family got together and they tried their best to get him to leave her, to have a separation and live quietly. They said to him, it was a most impossible life to continue making distressing scenes openly everywhere. Each was jealous of the other. They used to exchange hidings. Witness said that she, Madame Fahame, had a revolver which she used always to keep on a table beside her bed. She said she could not go about without it as she had a lot of jewellery. He, the deceased, also had a revolver, and it was generally locked up. In Paris, he had it at his bedside. Witness said that when he had lunch with them at the hotel on Monday, Ali Fahami and his wife were on very bad terms, insulting each other in the presence of the waiter. After lunch, Witness said Ali Fahami went upstairs and his wife begged Witness to take her out shopping as she could not speak any English. They went and she brought a few dresses to take back with her to France, having already bought the tickets for the journey. She was going to France for an operation. Her husband insisted that she should stay in England for the operation but she persisted in her determination to return to France. Visit to the theatre. She was always talking about being fed up and what a miserable life it was. In the evening, they all went to Daly's Theatre and had supper together on their return. At the theatre, she was very nervous all the time and it seemed as if he, the deceased, was trying to pacify her. She insisted that she must leave the following day. At supper, the quarrelling was worse than at lunch. He said she must not leave him, that she was his legally married wife, that she must remain and undergo the operation in England. 
Continuing, the witness said that Fahami asked her to dance with him, but she refused. She danced with the witness, and he tried to pacify her, but she replied in French that there was nothing doing. She went to bed first, and Ali Fahami went up immediately after her. He came back to the witness and said that she would not open the door to him. Witness and Ali had a short chat, and the witness tried to persuade him to let her go, but he replied that he would not. Voice on the phone. Come quickly, come quickly. I have shot at Ali. They went to bed about 1.45 a.m., the witness continued. First of all, I heard the telephone ringing at about 2.40 a.m. I was in bed at the time. At the telephone, I heard a voice calling, Hello, hello. Then all of a sudden, I heard Madame Fahami's voice, very agitated. She said, Venez vite, venez vite. Je te, je te sur Ali. Come quick, come quickly. I have shot at Ali. Continuing in French, she said, I do not know how I did it. Then I came down. I was in a very bad state of nerves and almost fell after running down four flights of stairs. I did not see Madame Fahami, but I saw my master. They were carrying him. I could not speak to him. Under the masterful direction of the famous defence lawyer, Sir Marshall Hall, Marguerite's defence was robust with many examples given regarding alleged abuse received which was considered very shocking in Victorian England. From the Westminster Gazette, the 13th of July, 1923, witness continued that while on a yacht, Fahami had locked up his wife and her maid, fastened the hatches and put the sailors on the gangway. This was all because of jealousy. Much was made of Marguerite's wish to have her operation in her native country of France. Fahami, insisting with his spousal rights, insisted that the operation would occur in London, England, possibly to minimise the chance of her to escape. From the Westminster Gazette, the 13th of July, 1923, Doctor's Story. Dr. E. F. S. Gordon of Southampton Street and the Strand said that Madame Fahami had been his patient. It was arranged that she should enter a nursing home on Tuesday for an operation on Wednesday. He next saw her at 2.30am on the Tuesday morning at the Savoy Hotel with a police sergeant. She was very excited and said that she had shot at her husband and he had been taken away, and asked what on earth would happen. The police sergeant, who could not speak French, asked the witness to put his question to her. He asked if she had done it, and she said yes. He showed her a pistol, and asked whether it was with that, and she said yes. She produced a letter which was to the effect that her husband refused to allow her to have the operation in London or to take the responsibility of the operation and that she was going to her family in Paris. At Bow Street, Madame Fahami said that her husband had been ill-treating her that evening and had forced his attentions on her. The coroner asked, did not she say that her husband had threatened to kill her if she left him? The response was yes, if she had left him at all, not necessarily by going to Paris. Dr. Gordon added that Madame Fenemy stated that at supper her husband had threatened to smash her head in. In the bedroom he had approached, threatening her. She fired the pistol out of the window and then, thinking that it would be unloaded, fired it at him. She said that she had lost her head. She was thoroughly dazed and added, They say I have shot my husband. How many shots did I fire? 
Dr. Morris Newfield, house physician at Charing Cross Hospital, said one bullet entered the left temple and emerged on the right side of the neck after lacerations in the brain tissue. Four wounds in the back, armpit and left arm were caused by one bullet. The seventh wound was caused by a glancing shot in the neck. With the inquest verdict of finding Marguerite Fahami guilty of the murder of her husband, Marguerite was remanded to await trial. Headlines splashed across the national newspapers. The prosecution evidence was clear. It was recognised that Marguerite had fired at her husband and ultimately killed him. The prevailing question was whether this had been self-defence or if she had understood how the revolver worked. Under the able hands of Sir Marshall Hall, the defence, piece by piece, painted a picture of a woman terrified of her husband due to past abuse, mental, physical and sexual in manner. From the Belfast Newsletter, the 14th of September 1923, Madame Fahami cross-examined in her trial two issues for the defence. Evidence for the defence in the trial at the Old Bailey of Madame Fahami was concluded yesterday afternoon and Sir Edward Marshall Hall for the prisoner began his final speech to the jury. The pistol in witness box. Coming to Madame's explanation of the shooting, Mr Clark put some questions as to her knowledge of the mechanism of the pistol. Rising to her feet in the witness box, Madame took the pistol in her hand. She pulled the trigger once or twice and then exclaimed, I do not know anything about automatics. Here, Madame Fahami's voice broke and covering her face with her forearm, she sank into the chair. I never wanted to kill my husband, she stated. I only wanted to prevent him from killing me. I thought the sight of the pistol might frighten him. When Madame was being closely questioned about the shooting, she displayed emotion and distress. The Other Secret Document Sir Edward Marshall Hall, in re-examination, put to witness the secret document which Madame made on the 22nd of January this year and which she left with her lawyer in the event of her death. The document was as follows. I, Marie Marguerite Alibert of Sound Mind and Body, formally accuse in the case of death, violence or otherwise, Ali Bey of having contributed to my disappearance. Yesterday, on the 21st of January 1923, at three o'clock in the afternoon, he took his Bible, or Koran, I do not know how it's called, kissed it, put his hand on it, and swore to avenge himself upon me tomorrow, in eight days, months, or three months, that I must disappear by his hand. This oath was taken without any reason, neither jealousy, bad conduct, nor a scene on my part. I desire and demand justice for my daughter and for my family. Today he wanted to take my jewellery from me, and I refused. A woman's greatest mistake. In his speech for the accused, Sir Edward said his client made a great mistake, possibly the greatest mistake any Western woman could make marrying an Oriental. The curse of the case was the atmosphere which we here could not understand, the Eastern feeling of possession of the woman, the Turk in his harem entitled to have four wives if he liked for chattels. Asking the jury to take the broad view, counsel said there were already two issues before them. Either it was deliberate, premeditated and cowardly murder, or it was a shot fired by the woman from the pistol which she believed to be unloaded 
at a moment when she thought her life to be in danger. The Letters from Prince Edward VIII The Secrets of the Letters remained a secret. Margaret's past with the present was not brought up in court. The character of her husband, however, was utterly damaged. Charges of severe abuse and some of the most salacious kind was brought up in the court trial. The victim, the now dead Fahami, had his reputation tarnished beyond all possibility of sympathy. From the Weekly Dispatch in London, 16th of September, 1923. The Fahami trial acquittal scenes. Cheers and tears greet the verdict. Woman's collapse. With cheers, tears, the clapping of hands and hats flung high into the air, the public is said around the Old Bailey yesterday showed their approval when Madame Marie Margaret Fahami was, as reported in page one, acquitted of the murder of her Egyptian husband. Enormous interest was displayed at the concluding stage of the trial. Almost as soon as the court had risen the previous night, men and women began in the vicinity of the gallery door of the Old Bailey. By midnight, about 50 people were waiting. At eight o'clock yesterday morning, there were fully 200. When it was announced that a queue might be formed, there was a wild rush across Newgate Street, and within a minute, the queue stretched to the corner of the Old Bailey, a distance of about 50 yards. Inside the court, every seat was taken half an hour before the ceremonial knock on the door announced the entry of the judge. The seats behind the docks were filled with fashionably dressed women, many of whom drove up in motor cars. Several women sought to secure front positions by climbing over the backs of the seats. Madame Fahami entered the dock with a firm step, and as soon as she was taken her seat, Mr Justice Swift resumed his summing up from the point where he had broken off the previous evening. Marguerite was found not guilty, and let go. Tense moments accused woman's calm. The cold, logical summing up, delivered in a manner which was almost conversational, seemed to dispel for a short space the tenseness overhanging the hushed court. She remained calm to the end, but when she turned to go down to the cells as the jury retired at 12.24, she was pale and her lips quivered. The jury was absent for an hour and eight minutes and a wave of excitement passed through the court when an usher entered and indicated that the jury had come to a decision. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? Do you find Marie Margaret Fahami guilty of the murder of Ale Carmel Fahami Bey? The foreman said, not guilty. Then occurred the outburst of cheering which led to the clearing of the court. Madame Fahami was then informed of the verdict through an interpreter and the wardress assisted her from the dock. For several minutes, Madame Fahami's only words were non coupable, not guilty, which she seemed to force out between her dried lips. Marguerite attempted to lead a more obscure life. Legal questions arose regarding her claim to her now dead husband, given that she had proven not guilty of his murder. From the Lancashire Evening Post, 18th of September 1923, the Fahami Fortune. The best opinion in Cairo is that it will be impossible for Madame Fahami to secure possession of her husband's fortune. It is thought highly improbable that she would be able to satisfy a Muslim court of her complete innocence of the charge of murdering Fahame Bey. Unless she can do so, she inherits 
nothing. In all probability, therefore, half of the estate will be divided between Fahameh's three sisters and half will go to a paternal uncle. What about the secret letters from Prince Edward VIII? These were never published. Later letters refer to their potential impact at the time to the royal family. But we do not know the exact content. Only that there were conversations of a sexual nature, that Prince Edward VIII's views on the war were not in line with official government policy, and that he had made more than one negative reference about his father. Marguerite's later life. Marguerite returned to Paris, where she continued to act as an escort for older, wealthy men. She died at the age of 80. In going through her estate, it was found that even up to her death at 80, she had been supported by five different men simultaneously. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, Marguerite Alibert, the courtesan who got away with murder. We very much hope that you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are serial killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrages, organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. And Fridays are frightful, where we pull together several stories with a similar theme. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.